and in the account in the book of Exodus of Israel's sojourn at Mount Sinai. Through Moses, God has sealed a covenant with the Israelites in which he has committed himself to be their God and invited them to commit themselves to be his people. As part of the covenant, God can trust to Moses the Ten Commandments. They spell out the fundamental religious and moral attitudes and practices that are to distinguish the life of his people. In his teaching, Jesus reaffirms the commandments and draws out some of their implications. The first commandment has to do with our relationship with God. The book of Exodus formulates it this way. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven or on earth or in the water under the earth. In response to the temptation of Satan, Jesus evokes the same commandment when he says, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. When asked later in the Gospels, which is the greatest commandment, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. The great affirmation of the Bible is that the Creator God reveals himself in the story of Israel and in the life of Jesus as a God of liberation and salvation, a God who calls people into relationship with him. This relationship is often expressed in the language of covenant, whether it be the one that God sealed with Israel through Moses at Sinai, or the new covenant that he made with us in Christ. In both cases, we are called to live in ways that correspond to the relationship that has been established. That means keeping the Ten Commandments, and for us, trying to live according to the teaching and example of Jesus. The great tragedy in the incident of the golden calf is that the people not long after enthusiastically declaring their desire to embrace God's covenant turn away from him to worship an idol. Moses' absence from them on the mountain seems to have unleashed their insecurity and fear. They need something visible that will assure them of God's presence and that will serve as a focus for their worship. Their idolatry is in such flagrant contradiction to their earlier commitments that it takes an intervention of Moses to persuade God not to reject them out of hand. Many of us tend to equate idolatry with various forms of pagan polytheism the kind of thing that was common in the ancient world. In that sense, few of us are idolatrous. When we think, however, of idolatry as involving a refusal to recognize God as God, a refusal to orient our lives on Him, it becomes clear that we too are susceptible to it. To make something or someone an idol is to make them the focus and center of our life and to do so in a way that demands all our devotion and commitment. In some cases, it might be pleasure. In others, money or fame, power or influence. Even science and technology, as positive as they are in themselves, can be embraced in a way that borders on idolatry. In the last century, political movements like Nazism and Communism turned nationalism and class struggle into idols. The enormous violence and suffering such movements provoked 
stand as warnings of how destructive it can be to regard as God what in fact is not God. The most effective way of avoiding idolatry in all its subtle and not so subtle forms is by developing a true sense of God. Serious prayer and a conscious and reflective participation in the liturgy can help us do that. In recognizing God as God, we can't help but recognize that everything else as beautiful and attractive, as powerful and fascinating as it might be, is not God. It is part of God's creation. To be used not as a substitute for God, but as a means of giving God glory and of furthering human well-being. Let us now in faith and trust present before God our needs. For all of us, that our sharing in this Eucharist will help us deepen our sense of God and renew our commitment to him. Let us pray to the Lord. For the intentions of our donors and of those who have asked us to pray for them, let us pray to the Lord. For the unemployed and for the working poor, let us pray to the Lord. For the elderly and the chronically ill and for those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. For those who have died recently, especially for victims of violence and of natural disasters, let us pray to the Lord. Gracious God, we ask you to hear and grant these prayers as well as the more personal ones that each one of us has in his or her own heart all this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. By the mingling of this water and wine, go partake of this divinity, keep partake of our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine, and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Pray, my sisters and brothers, that our sacrifice may be made acceptable to God, the Father Almighty. All-powerful God, look upon our weakness. May the sacrifice we offer bring us purity and strength. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Amen. Father, all-powerful and ever-living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks. You ask us to express our thanks by self-denial. We are to master our sinfulness and conquer our pride. We are to show to those in need your goodness to ourselves. Now with all the saints and angels, we praise you forever. 